Hello and welcome to this 500 subscriber special. And I want to start by saying thank you to each and every one of you who have supported this channel and helped it to grow since March. Thank you so much for your support and for your really thoughtful and informed questions and comments on each and every video. We've got quite the little community of early rail fans going on here and I think that's absolutely wonderful. I've not been able to answer all your questions because there have been so many. So I've picked out some of the best and grouped them thematically. But I have read them all, I've considered them all and they are all really thoughtful and have provided much inspiration for future videos. A lot of you lovely people have been asking about the future direction of this corner of YouTube. Topics I'll be covering and so forth. So in reply to Liam Guff, I'll be sticking solidly to the 19th century, mostly before 1850-1860, but perhaps with some exceptions, who doesn't like the Stirling single? Trings, trains, yes, we will be looking at rolling stock, and I'm currently working on a video project exploring what it was like to travel on the 1830s and 1840s railway. Furry Pupau and Aaron Field, yes, we will be looking at track, infrastructure and things like that. Absinthe fan dubs ask about pre-eccentric valve gear. Yes, I will try to cover valve gear and pre-eccentric valve gear, but as ever with such a visual medium as YouTube and such a technical concept as valve gear, as ever it's finding illustrations of them and in particular of animations how they worked. I'm not ruling out valve gear altogether, it's only to find the best way of how to present it. I could sit and talk for 15 minutes about how Trevithick and Headley used tappets, and that Blankensop and Murray used a cam revolving in a box to provide reciprocating motion to the valves, but I don't think that we're very engaging. Sarah Liv asks about the biggest surprises of research. History isn't static either as a concept or in terms of research, and our sum of knowledge is constantly growing and constantly changing. Yet when we think about Richard Trevithick or John Blenkinsop, we like to think we've perhaps reached a sum total of knowledge about them. I mean, after all, it's 200 years. The exhaustive study on Trevithick, published in 2019, reassessed all the known sources and about Trevithick and his locomotive, and reinforced conclusions which were made in the 1950s that we don't know what the Pinadar and locomotive looked like. Yet frustratingly, that knowledge has still to be disseminated to the wider public and the wider enthusiast community. But yet, colour me surprised when only this year, Dr Michael Lewis, a renowned expert on early railways, presented not only new findings on Trevithick, but also on Blenkinsop. He confirms that a shadow of a doubt that the Blenkinsop locomotive at Nantiglo in South Wales did exist and was in use for at least 15 or 20 years, but also that the interpretation of the Trevithick engine at Penudaran has changed with evidence now that instead of a return flue boiler, it in fact had a breeches tube type boiler. So that the fire tube was shaped like a pair of trousers, in other words it was bifurcated or Y-shaped, with two fire holes and the two tubes uniting into one at the chimney end. So that research published just this year completely changes our understanding of the Penudaran locomotive. It was one of those, I can't believe what I've just read, so I'll read it over and over and hope it sinks in type of moments. And it's one of those things that makes early railways so fascinating that there is still information to be learned about people like Trevithick 200 years after the event. And that's just fascinating, amazing. Over on Facebook, Luke Griffiths from the Tanfield Railway. And the Tanfield Railway is one of the oldest in the world, opened in the 1720s and has the oldest railway arch, the, the great Causey arch from 1727, and Luke asks whether I think there is an increasing interest in early railways, and I have to say emphatically yes. This is in part due to work by museums such as Beamish, with their working replicas of Steam Elephant and Puffing Billy, pulling appropriate stuff for people to ride in. 
but also in its recreation of Early Wooden Track 2. It's also good that George Stevenson is still in the national curriculum, although only at primary level. And Rocket, both the original and the replica, are still incredibly popular, especially the original with its grand tour, visiting Liverpool Road Station in Manchester and going back home to Newcastle before finally settling down to its new home at the NRM. And at the National Railway Museum too, the replica of Rocket pulling passenger trains and when that goes on tour is also incredibly popular. Rocket is one of those go-to, the key iconic locomotives of the early railways, for good or for bad. And this is where places like Beamish and the Stevenson Rail Museum and of course Tanfield have a role to play in pointing out that there was such a thing as a railway before Rocket, before George Stevenson, that the railway is not just 200 but 400 years old. As to celebrating bicentenaries, I think museums and heritage railways have a vital role to play in telling the story of railways and telling it in a way which is engaging, which is fun and which is relevant, but which is truthful and which is honest and fits the historical fact, not falling to the furthest, mostest, bestest trap or becoming obsessed with one particular line as being the first. As usual, there'll be a researcher coming along saying, Excuse me, but I think you'll find that this other railway was the first, and that person is usually me. So we have to be truthful and honest, and not fall into the traps of soundbite history or popularism. There have been a couple of questions on paint and livery. To answer Rocky Railroad animation, the pigments used would have been mineral-based, mixed with oil and with a turpentine carrier. So they'll be based on iron oxides, copper, chrome and lead, and even carbon, such as lamp black. The colours in use would have been full and rich, but they wouldn't have been very bright. Um, the colour we see on the replica of Rocket is far too bright for a 1830s shade of yellow. It'd be a bit more mustardy, really. So, so the colours would have been quite muted and would have been further muted with coats of vegetable based varnish which would have given a slightly brown tint to the whole thing. Think the type of colours you would see in a stately home or in a Jane Austen TV dramatisation. Um, rich colours, very stately home colours but not very bright or very blingy. They won't, they won't, the colours wouldn't pop. Gary Peter asks about the colour of Rocket. And we know it was certainly painted yellow at the Rennhall Trials. Thereafter, it was painted green. And it was definitely painted green by the time of the opening day in September 1830. We know from the Liverpool and Manchester Locomotive Department accounts that they never purchased yellow paint. They only ever purchased red lead as a primer, black, dark green and white. So we're used to seeing Rocket in its Rainhill racing colours. And it's from this we have the image of a locomotive and a train of carriages painted in bright primary colours. With lots of shiny bright work and, and brass and fancy work. But that is not how it or other locomotives appeared when doing actual work. There's no evidence that despite artist reconstructions of Planet or Northumbrian being painted yellow, they were ever painted yellow. I'd also argue that the livery carried by the reconstructed lion and by the replica of Planet is also wrong. We're used to seeing lovely polished oak boiler cladding with brass boiler bands and much fancy work. But technical drawings show from the period show boiler cladding to have been painted. And indeed the oldest surviving paint on Rocket comes from its boiler cladding and its dark green. We also know from the Liverpool and Manchester archive that the board admonished John Melling, the locomotive superintendent, for putting on too much brass and fancy work and rocket and other locomotives and told him to remove it. The board also ordered that all the polished brass work and ironwork be painted with black varnish like black Japan lacquer, as too much time had been spent cleaning the engines, so they would have been quite sombre looking Overall dark green and black. Sticking with Rocket, in reply to Glinner, yes, 
Rocket was definitely used on permanent way duties from November 1829 to December of 1830. She'd been repainted green but was still in Rainhill condition until spring 1831, when, following a serious accident, she was rebuilt with a steam dome, internal steam pipe and lowered cylinders. She also gained a smoke box and a wet batch firebox at the same time. It's interesting to note that Rocket had a very short working life. She was obsolete by January 1830, and despite the replica hauling passenger trains, she never appears to have been used in frontline service and had been retired by 1833. Will Dunklin asked about early locomotives and their long working lives. Copper Knob, now in the National Railway Museum in York, was built in Liverpool in 1846 and remained at work until 1898, and her sister engine until 1899, both in a original form. In France, the little first-generation Budicoms built before 1850 were still at work on short lines and minor routes into the 1910s, albeit mostly converted to tank engines, and in France the expression is locomotive tender or tender locomotive, and often fitted with more recent mod cons such as injectors rather than water pumps, looking most like self-propelled pieces of plumbing. Chris Eden Green, hello old boy. Um, I think the most important invention for railway safety was the electric telegraph by Cook and Wheatstone, as that meant you could introduce block working rather than the time interval system. With the time interval system, a train was set off every, say, every half hour and had to make sure it stuck punctually to the timetable. No one knew what had happened to it once it had left and trains were dispatched in the belief the line was clear and the signalling system worked on the basis that the line was clear. When of course there could have been an almighty pile up round the next corner that trains would continue to pile into every 30 minutes. The electric telegraph meant that for the first time staff at station A would know when the train they had dispatched to station B had got there. It also meant that the line could be divided into sections termed blocks, each controlled by a telegraph in a signal box, and a train was only permitted to enter each block once it was safe to do so, after an early train had left that block or section. It was a massive leap forwards in terms of railway safety. The next biggest leap Sadly, as a result of an accident, was the fitting of continuous automatic brakes as standard in 1889, following the Armagh Railway disaster, when a trainload of Sunday school children ran away and crashed with several hundred fatalities. What we mean by continuous and automatic brakes is we mean that every vehicle in the train has a brake, which can be worked by the locomotive, and that it will work automatically in the case of an accident such as a coupling braking. In Britain, vacuum brakes were adopted as standard as they were cheaper than the more efficient Westinghouse air brake. Sadly, due to the lobbying power of railway companies in Parliament or the House of Lords, the regulation of railways in the United Kingdom was very watered down, very laissez-faire, and even after the law stated that automatic and continuous brakes had to be fitted, many railway companies objected on the grounds of cost or were slow on the uptake. It's all a bit sad, really. Victorian lad asks, what is my least favourite period of railway history? I have to say it's the 1950s and the 1960s. I find British Railway's black livery and filthy, dirty, horrible locomotives depressing and uninspiring. I understand they're a huge part of many people's childhoods and that those people make up the core demographic of railway enthusiasts, and I get the drug of nostalgia, but I think such locomotives look ugly and I don't get the fondness for filthy, clanking, horrible, dirty engines one little bit. Daniel Huppenthal asked about difference between British and American locomotive design. The divergence in design was primarily due to the track in America being very lightweight, being often lightly laid and with much sharper curves and steeper gradients than in Britain. So a locomotive like John Bull and an 040 built by Stevenson in Newcastle 
was ideally suited for the flat racetrack of the Liverpool and Manchester Railway, it was not suited to the very curving, lightly Camden and Amboy, and even its short 5 foot 2 wheelbase was too long for the curves on that line, with the coupling rods having to be removed to help it take curves. And it was because of the sharp curves that bogies, both on locomotives and rolling stock, became far more common in America than in the UK, despite the bogey having been painted in Britain back in 1812. Hawker Hellfire posits the question about what I'd build if I'd won the lottery. Well, if I wasn't already involved in a scheme to build a replica of Lion, I'd have to say if money were no object, then a blanking stop locomotive to the correct 4 foot 1 gauge and the track to run it on, as it would be pretty useless without the rack and pinion track. Or looking more modern to the 20th century, I do have a big soft spot for the Lancashire and York's Railway Dreadnoughts, or maybe Stanya's one-off turbomotive. I've always wanted to know what sound the turbomotive made, and there's only one way to find out, is to build it and run it. That goes some way to answering Racer32X's question. I think the Blenkinsop locomotive is one of the most important and influential, but sadly least recognised. Blenkinsop didn't have as good a PR department as George Stevenson did. But Blenkinsop, not Stevenson, built the first commercially successful and viable locomotive, and it was his design which would inspire later locomotive builders, including Stevenson. I am probably very biased here, but my favourite early locomotive is Planet. But then again, after all, I have regularly fired her and I have driven her. She was the first modern locomotive the first purpose-built mainline express passenger locomotive and the first of what we'd call a class, with nearly a hundred being built globally. Then there's Lion and she comes a very, very close second in my affections. And finally, in reply to Shuji To, my next video will be a break from the norm and will feature a Victorian record breaker. So I hope you've enjoyed that. I certainly did. I hope I've managed to answer as many questions as fully as possible. If I've not been able to answer your question, please accept my apologies. And see you next time on Rail Story.